This is Jeff Marsh. He was one of the slowest ODI batters of his era, and really, of all time. But this was not by accident. He was told to play this way. Marsh was the first anchor in ODI cricket, or at least the first person who embraced and talked about his role in that way. He was supposed to bat as long as he could and let everyone else score quicker around him. In 1987, Jeff Marsh made the second most runs in the tournament. And that is where this all started. Australia winning World Cups, with Marsh running singles and facing dot ball. 36 years and 11 days later, his son, Mitch Marsh, was batting at number three for Australia. Two World Cups inside India, two Marshes, two 400 run totals, and two winning tournaments. The only difference really is the scoring rate. Jeff Marsh was ahead of his time by being slow. Mitch Marsh is like a number three enforcer, a position that really no other team seems to have. So Australia are ahead of the game again. And when you think about all of this, this family of Australian victors, all bound by World Cup winning DNA, if you read the many comments and social media posts out there, that's what you'll hear, that Australia cricket has winning in its blood. But outside of the marshes, that can't actually be true, right? So we decided to go back and look at all the World Cup victories and how Australia actually got them. So if you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber to get a huge discount off your Nord VPN plan plus four additional months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a cricketer protects its nether region with Nord VPN today. Let's start with 1987, the birth of Australian professionalism. No one thought much of this team coming in, but they were looking at cricket in a different way that hadn't really existed before. They turned up in Chennai and they properly prepared for a World Cup, which sounds normal now, but was not then. They had a plan and players willing to execute it. And remember, this was a format of cricket that still wasn't taken all that seriously. They won this World Cup with five interesting things. Obviously, Jeff Marsh was incredibly important. He was the spine of that Australian batting. But his opening partner, David Boone, was the third lead run scorer in that tournament. But they had other advantages in 87. One was that while Australia had always been a good running between the wickets team in tests, they really weaponized it in that year for ODIs. Dean Jones essentially took Javid Mean that style, but did it fitter and faster. And the rest of the team just ran as hard as they could as well. There's also the bowling. Craig McDermott isn't thought of that highly today. With all the bowlers that followed for Australia, he got overlooked. And in those days, we didn't rate ODI bowling as much. But McDermott was really a strike bowler well ahead of his time. And unlike in tests, he was a threat all the way through the innings. This series, he bowled very fast and took the most wickets. But often he took them with his off-cutting slow ball, which was still relatively new at that point. In fact, Australia had terrible spin. Tim May was a good bowler, but it never really worked for him in ODIs. And so Australia needed their quicks to step up, and they did, by bowling slow. McDermott's off-cutter was important, but Australia had two all-rounders with another slow ball. Simon O'Donnell is thought to be the man who at least popularised, if not even invented, the back of the hand slow ball. But he was not alone, as Steve Waugh could also bowl it. This is a very underrated reason why Australia won this World Cup. Waugh would eventually be known as a sort of grumbling middle order rock. But in this tournament, he was essentially like a young Dwayne Bravo, slogging in the end and bowling huge slow balls to embarrass everyone at the death. But there was also Australia's fielding. Like their running between wickets, this was about fitness and preparation. But they were actually prepared to dive. They practiced throwing at the stumps quite a bit, and it meant a huge advantage in the field at a time when boundaries weren't as important. This World Cup completely changed how this form of cricket was played. Other teams started looking for more singles and twos, they started fielding with dives, and of course, slow balls completely would take over the game. This all started here. West Indies had shown glimpses of these things, but Australia professionalised it, and no one expected them to win that World Cup. And that is also probably the last time that has ever happened. After a disastrous 92 campaign at home and running to Sri Lanka in 96, the team who changed ODIs had managed to lose twice in a row. 99 didn't actually start particularly well either. The great news is that they had some of the best seen bowlers in the world at that time, and yet they chose to open the bowling with this guy, Adam Dale, a little known outswing bowler, and because of that, they moved Glenn McGrath to first change. 
Australia had the best new bowler probably ever, and they made him a first change specialist. Once they abandoned that idea, Australia stormed back in. In that same tournament, Shane Warne started slow as well. He was actually low on confidence, which sounds incredible, but was true because Australia had dropped him when he was struggling to come back from his injury. The problem for the other teams was that he found his form at the end, which is also when McGrath got good. And I'll be honest, I am unsure how any team could beat Warne and McGrath in form. But the odd thing is, this is the only time in World Cup cricket that they actually had peak Warne and peak McGrath together. And in the end, that was enough. Australia made plenty of errors along the way, though. They shunned Andrew Simons and Ian Harvey, who didn't even make the squad. They went with all-rounders Brendan Julian and Shane Lee, who both struggled. But luckily, they brought out their spare all-rounder from 1987, Tom Moody. And he would go on to have an economy of 4.3 and score with a strike rate of 130. But the really important player from 87 was Steve Waugh. Back then, he was a cutting-edge all-rounder. But now he was barely bowling due to hamstring injuries and scoring at a much more middle-aged strike rate. But when he was needed in the Super 6 and semi-final game, he stood up with huge innings that saved Australia from embarrassment. But even when he failed, Michael Bevan was there. The only man before the year 2000 to average 50 in ODI cricket. He was the last man out in the semi-final for Australia and he pulled them to the exact right score. He always was more of a mathematician than a cricketer. And despite this 99 team being great on paper, it wasn't as good in performance. But War, Warren, McGrath and Bevan were enough in the end. 2003 was in the middle of the three-peat, but it wasn't all that dominant. So again, Michael Bevan had to pull Australia back from some very bad positions. And for two World Cups in a row, Michael Bevan was the one player in ODIs you just couldn't dismiss. But in the games against New Zealand and England, Bevan paired up with the tail enders to make a decent total. Brett Lee chipped in once, and the other one was Andy Bickle. And that is where this gets fun. Because Australia were not supposed to be using Bickle as a player at all. Their first choice was Jason Gillespie, who blitzed at the start of the tournament, but then got injured, and so Bickle had to come in. And not only did he take 16 wickets at 12, but ruminate on the fact he averaged 12 for a moment, please. He also made a 64. 30 more than his second highest ODI score ever. That is incredible depth. But the same thing happened with their spin. Brad Hogg was a late replacement after Warren's drug ban, and he took 13 wickets at 24. But let's just focus on all the bowlers, because Australia took 101 wickets in that World Cup at a bowling average of 18. 18! They were the best bowling team in the history of a World Cup by average, and they did it with two of their best four bowlers not there. That is next level. In that tournament, if you made more than 220 against that team, you were doing brilliantly. But in the final, you needed a lot more because their top three was incredible. Matt Hayden took over from Mark Waugh and actually did better. Adam Gilchrist went off as well. And this was when Ricky Ponting's form, skill and youthful freedom all met at the same time. He was what Dean Jones was trying to perfect 16 years earlier. And in the final, he was incredible and Australia won. The 2007 team, at least on paper and look at their results, is probably the greatest ODI team that ever existed. They won all their games again, but this time by a combined 671 runs with 40 wickets and 446 balls in hand. They clocked white ball cricket. The top order was even better this time. Matt Hayden had the second greatest series by an opener ever. Adam Gilchrist hit a cup winning 100 and Ricky Ponting averaged 67. And how about this for a fun fact? In the 03 and 07 final, Australia scored a quicker than seven runs and over in both. The bowlers were Murali, Vast, Malinga, Zahir, Srinath, and Harbhajan. Bonkers. But the thing is that their middle order was incredible as well. Everyone made runs. Shane Watson batted like 99 Kluzner. They had the highest batting average ever in a World Cup. And remember, Warren never came back to ODIs, and so his understudy hog took 21 wickets at an average of 16. He would retire from international cricket a year later, and Australia was so arrogant, they didn't even worry about it that much. Why would they? There was always someone else to come in. From 1987 to 2007, I took the best 15 Australian players and put them in one team. And then I made another team of the second best. And I'm pretty sure the backups would have won at least one or maybe two World Cups. It's insane. Put it this way. This player is not current day famous. In fact, when I say his name, it might be the first time anyone has uttered it in a cricket context this year. 
But Nathan Bracken was one of the best bowlers in the world at this point. He took the fourth most wickets for Australia, but he took them at an average of 16 and an economy of 3.6 runs and over. This wasn't the ODI cricket of the 80s. This was 2007. And while we were all talking about Sean Tate's 23 wickets, which were pretty good as well, and of course, Glenn McGrath again, Bracken put up one of the best all-time World Cup chokeholds ever. And that World Cup finally finished Australia's golden era. They would finally lose one World Cup. And that was it, of course, before they were back to being at home and they were avenging their terrible 92 tournament. This one was essentially between them and New Zealand. And that is what happened in the final. Five balls into the game, Mitchell Stark had all but ended it. In that tournament, he took 22 wickets at an average of 10. I have said some silly numbers today. I don't think I will say anything sillier than that. I will pause for a moment for you to reattach your nipples. Done? This team was so good that if you combine Cummins and Hazelwood into one bowler, they still didn't even play a full tournament. And one of the reasons was that Australia had James Faulkner at number eight. Has any player burned as bright and faded as quick as he did? He averaged 35 with a bat and ODIs at better than a runner ball, while averaging 30 when he was bowling with his back-of-the-hand slower ball at the death. This was probably the first tournament Australia had true England-style batting depth all the way down the order. And they didn't need it because their top order was so good that Faulkner basically didn't bat. Australia had five players averaging over 40, but it gets better because three of them did it better than a runner ball. Warner, Haddon, and Watson. Oh, wait, four of them did it at better than a run ball, but the other one was Glenn Maxwell, and he did it at a strike rate of 180. Yeah. Doney basically admitted that Australia just scored too quick in the semi-final. And that finally gets us to the latest victory. A riches-to-riches win by a team who was headbutting a wall and crying after two games, but ended up with a tactical masterclass in the final to win the entire thing. But they also just smashed the shit out of the ball. Their top three all averaged more than 48, and again, did it at more than a run of ball. They made 600s between them and completely annihilated teams to overcome their middle order issues. In fact, Maxwell was their middle order kind of on his own when he wasn't falling off golf carts. He actually slowed down in this tournament from how good he was eight years ago. Everyone gets old, I guess. But he also played one of the greatest innings of all time and terrified everyone after that point. And what about their spin? By the finals, Adam Zampa was getting hit again. But my God, he kept Australia in this tournament. The wins against Sri Lanka and England can be completely traced back to him. But he took so many wickets in the tournament, and he had to because Stark and Cummins were awful for long periods. In fact, so was Zampa to start with. And he basically went from zero to the leading wicket taker in the tournament. And you will notice all the way through this, we haven't mentioned captains much. And that's because Australia has not been led by Arjuna Ranatunga, Martin Crowe, or MS Dhoni type captains. Alan Border, Steve Waugh, Ricky Ponty, and Michael Clark are not seen as the reason that their teams won. But in this particular final, Australia came into it as an outsider for the first time since 87. And Pat Cummins did all of his best captaincy in one game. Those guys I mentioned before have better reputations as captains. I'm not sure they ever had a World Cup final like Cummins did. And so Australia, who have been turning up to World Cup since 2011 in a haphazard way, meaning they now have to work it out during the tournament. And that is exactly what they did. This ended with them beating perhaps one of the best non-Australian teams at a World Cup ever. But there's one other thing I want to mention. Fielding. So 36 years and 11 days after they won the first World Cup by revolutionising fielding, now it's not so special, right? The whole of cricket does that. And yet somehow, again, Their fielding was the difference between everyone else and Australia winning another trophy. 1987 is still the most interesting because that is the only time they didn't have a spinner they could trust or an all-rounder who could bat in the top six and automatically bowl his 10 overs every match. But it was also the tournament where they were ahead of the game. Since then, when it comes to the tactics, they have been on par with the rest of the world or even slightly behind. But none of that matters because Australia have played in eight finals and they lost two of the first three and none since. They get to a final, they attack, and they win with the bat, ball, and in the field. And that is the key. If you make it to a World Cup final, you have to beat the opposition. And that is what they do. This 2023 team were written off as disorganized, woke, beta snowflakes. And while the rest is obviously nonsense, the disorganized bit was obviously true. They could very easily have gone home early. 
And in that semi-final, they had to grind out a win against a tough South African side. And when they made it to that final game, they tried every tactical trick they could, and then they hit their way out of danger when they were batting, while having an anchor at the other end to help them get home. That was Travis Head and Manus Labuschagne. But spiritually, it could have been Mitch and Jeff Marsh. So is winning World Cups for Australia in the blood? Obviously, outside of that family from WA, no. But there is one trend you can see in every single one of their wins. They have lots of fast bowlers who are really good. And they always have. 67% of wickets in ODIs are taken by fast bowlers. Australia has the best seam average and strike rate and the second greatest economy in the history of World Cups. But perhaps most importantly, they just have the most wickets for seamers in World Cups ever. And second place is 50 wickets behind them. Is it in the blood? No. But it might just be in the seam.